All right. Greetings, everyone. This is Ben Murray, and welcome to another Leaders of Modern Finance podcast. I'm excited about the show today. I'd like to introduce Betsy George. Betsy, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah. So first, let's start out. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then a little bit about where you work for. Sure, sure. Um, I grew up in Southern California, so still in my home base, basically, and have been in finance and accounting my entire career, which is uh, 30-something years, I'll say, without uh, dating myself too much. And I enjoy what I do. I love working in finance. I find it really fascinating and interesting. So I always feel lucky that I landed um, in a career that I truly enjoy. That's great. And you're with the city of Oxnard now, is that right? Yes. Yeah. I'm the chief financial officer at the city of Oxnard. It's a um, fairly large city. We have about 200,000 residents and at the city there's 1,400 employees, and we provide all the regular city services, fire, police, um, streets, trash, utilities, yeah. water, the, the whole gambit. Yeah, everything that people forget about that happens all the time. So really interesting. Yeah, we'll dive into kind of that public-private sector viewpoint. But let's start with, let's talk shop here in finance and accounting. Uh, so always interested to hear you know, your team structure, right? You over your CFO, so oversee finance, accounting, maybe some other departments in there. It'd be good to hear about. So tell me about your team structure and, and team size right now to, to manage that, that city budget. Sure, sure. There's about 35 individuals in the entire uh, finance department, we call it, which encompasses both accounting and finance, as well as budget and purchasing. So those are the major departments. We have a purchasing manager and a budget manager, and then of course, individuals under those areas. We are fortunate, I, I like to say anyway, <laughs> that we uh, payroll that this organization exists under human resources. Okay. You know, throughout my career, I've seen it go both ways, but um, that's one uh, semi-thankless uh, duty that you have to do at every organization. So oh, happy yeah, about definitely. have it. Yeah, I know. And I was just having that discussion today. It's like, yeah, payroll sometimes in HR, sometimes in finance. It varies depending on the org. So, and tell us so we can size, you know, so 35 employees in your department and the city, like, right, we're probably not talking maybe like revenue, like the private sector, but what, what is, say, your budget size? You know, how big, you know, what, what kind of dollars are we working with, with the, in the city here? You know, our uh, operating budget is about $400 million every year. And then we have a bunch of larger capital expenditures. And of course, some of that revenue comes from taxes and some of it comes from grants or um, other government agencies. Okay. So 400 million OPEX plus you have a, a CapEx budget on top of that? Yes, yes. Okay. And how it's, in, it's really interesting. I mean, how has that trended over the past couple? Well, I guess you're... You've been there, you said, about six months now? Yes. Yeah, a little bit more than six months. So very new at this organization. Okay. And maybe you don't, I mean, has that trended pretty consistent, that 400 million OPEX budget or moving a little bit over time? It's actually going up. We just passed a, a recent sales tax um, for our area, an additional one and a half percent, which we estimate is going to bring us about another fifty million dollars a year. So we've just had a pretty big increase uh, very recently, the twenty twenty elections, um, which is one of the big differences between private sector and public sector. You, it's hard to control your own revenue. You don't just get a new glossy sales campaign and go out there and or build a better mousetrap and yep. and uh, get more sales. Yeah. Yeah. So maximize what, yeah, that budget and try to maximize the potential of that budget. So interesting because normally I'd say, Hey, all right, next, you know, what numbers do you report to the board, but tell us how that differs in the public sector. You don't necessarily have the board, but what's the board equivalent in the, in the public sector? Yeah. So we have a city council and then there's the mayor, which is the head of the city council. So he might be equivalent to the board chair. Yes. And um, one of the big differences is in budget, you're really your reporting is very piecemeal. You know, there isn't so much the big picture. There's much more interest in, you know, what are you doing with your COVID relief dollars? Or what are you doing with your gas tax dollars? Or passed a certain measure on the ballot and how are you spending those additional dollars? Versus the private sector, you know, you really wanna see the big picture and, and how's mm -hmm. the company going overall and what direction are we headed? Okay, so yeah, so that's really interesting. Less big picture, more, what do you say, project-specific spend that you have to track and then show results from that spend? 
Yes, exactly. As far as periodic reporting, I mean, of course, we go um, once a year with our budget to the city council and we do a mid-year budget review and then once a year with our year-end actuals. So we do the big picture periodically throughout the year, but those regular, which you would typically have maybe a monthly or quarterly board meeting where you're really um, drilling down on some of the dashboard specifics of an organization, that here is really project-based or um, cash flow based yeah. you know, where the, where the funding is coming from. Mm -hmm. So really interesting. So it's kind of quarterly, maybe semi, semi-annual, of course, the annual budget presentation, more big picture, but you're saying say those monthly meetings or however those are half happening more project level, very detailed look in, into that spend versus big picture. Yeah, exactly. We actually meet uh, the first and third Tuesday of every month is the okay. city council meeting. And then we have a finance and governance committee meeting on the alternate Tuesdays, the second and fourth Tuesdays. So we only get a Tuesday off of a nighttime uh, governance meeting if there's five Tuesdays in the month. Okay. And is that, I mean, is that a pretty, is that a lot of work for each of those meetings, you know, where you're creating stuff ad hoc, or is it a pretty good routine where you, you're producing that that documentation, that reporting anyway to to present to the council. No, it's mostly all ad hoc. So <laughs> there's a, a a lot of governance. So even like a large purchase order, those types of things, those have to go to city council. And so mm -hmm. if you're, for instance, this most recent city council meeting, we you know we're purchasing new fire engines and then also increasing our budget for our ERP system. Mm -hmm. So those are two completely separate items with separate presentations and separate staff memos and uh, yeah. yeah so it's it's, it's a yeah, constant so it, uh, uh job security with lots of work to do all the time. yeah so it's not yeah like yeah a lot of detail that you have to understand how those projects uh are doing moving along uh versus just like hey here's the you know the financial statements for the month for example right yeah because you know we're dealing with the public's money i mean it's taxpayer funds and we need to both not just providing it to the city council but also the um community who are funding these projects essentially and that we are being good stewards of their money and spending mm -hmm. it wisely and that the projects that we've planned are successful and the outcome is what we had hoped it would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. And any, so, you know, I come from the software world, so we have very specific lingo on customer acquisition costs and LTV, all these metrics. So is there any common metrics within the public sector or is it still really just, you know, spend-based, project-based? It's there are this spin based project based and of course we have our you know alphabet soup of acronyms but mm -hmm. as far as um, results and ROI and those types of things there aren't necessarily specific to the government. Okay. You know, yeah. Interesting. So this this kind of segs well into our next question, right? You've got this really strict meeting routine with a council producing the reports, uh, project management type reports. So tell us a little bit about your tech stack in finance, accounting, and, and purchasing? Um, well, we are in the process of implementing a new ERP system, which will cover um, you know, all of that payroll, human capital management, uh, purchasing, asset management, the budget. It'll be the mm -hmm. whole suite. And um, the current software that we're using, I think this is common among government agencies and maybe even in the private sector, is we've had our current software for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, at a large organization to do a new an implementation touches so many areas, it tends to be something that could, you know, delayed until it's absolutely necessary because it's going to impact so many people. Okay. And is, you know, I find in certain industries, there's very specific, like, uh, tech you could say that's just that's adopted by those industries so in the public sector are there certain erp systems that people are always looking at then yes definitely so if i say the name that we're implementing too which happens to be tyler munis um, mm -hmm. anybody who's in a local government entity that may be listening to this has certainly heard of it but mm -hmm. in the private sector probably not similar that in the public sector if i talk about um, you know, NetSuite or mm -hmm. Great Plain Dynamic or something like that, you know, they wouldn't necessarily have heard of those areas. Okay. All right. So going with the ERP, uh, ERP route, not point solutions, kind of bolting on, on systems or really looking at this to, to cover your full kind of finance, accounting and payroll cycle then. 
Yes, exactly. And we have external systems. For instance, we're doing, you know, planning and permits for the city. So our permits office has a separate software where they can accept electronic plans and, mm -hmm. and not have to get big rolls of blueprints coming in through the door. So there's streets inventory and GIS software. So we can keep an inventory of all the trees. I mean, you, it's amazing when you dig into the details, what it takes to run a city and what operations looks like for a whole community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot going on, a lot of assets to track, right? A lot of labor, a lot of maintenance work orders, right? Against those assets. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we have, you know, similar, yeah, we'll have a work order system. Mm -hmm. We have a help desk system for our IT people. You know, it's all... And how, you know, interesting, right, with tech stack becoming so important now, so many different solutions, how, you know, when you go and, you know, went through the selection process for an ERP, who else is at that table, like maybe assisting you? Do you have, a, a say, a VP of IT or something like that? Who, who's helping with all these uh, tech stack decisions within the city? Yeah, so we brought in a consultant to to help us, you know, someone who is very familiar with doing, you know, even drafting the RFP, going out to get um, to decide who we're going to evaluate. And then also there is a chief information officer here, of course. And then we will we'll bring in some of the main users it, at the city. It happens to be public works, which they oversee the utilities and parks and trees and streets and alleyways. And, and so they're going to be the one of the heaviest users of purchase orders and asset management, things like that. So it's a, it's a cross section of folks that are brought in. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so when did you kick off the, have you started the, the new ERP implementation then? Yes, we're right towards the finish line at this point. We're, um, scheduled to go live on July 1st of 2022. So we're really in the final stages. We did the um, initial selection process back in 2019 mm -hmm. and then, you know, officially launched with just starting to make sure that we had all of our um, needs assessment done and our um, current state and our 2B state and all that documentation started in 2020. And then 2021 is when we started the programming and all of that uh, customization, some of yep. the customization that needs to be doing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a pretty long process, huge system to put in place. So when did it kind of like, you know, officially kick, did it say officially kick off in January or even last year? I'm just curious, like when you just start, hey, let's kick off this project and we go live, like what is that time frame? How many months or even years? Yeah, I think it's probably about two years, a little bit less than two years, maybe from kickoff of like, we have a team, we brought in our subject matter experts, mm -hmm. and um, we call them FALs, our functional area leads. And they started um, probably around in January 2020. I'm sorry, COVID years, everything. <laughs> time, it, time has become up. messy. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So January 2021 is when we started having, you know, reoccurring meetings and really getting together. And um, so, yeah, so we're about 12 months into that. And, and now, you know, in launching training, making sure we have lots of um, user acceptance testing and we're doing all of that, that now. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge project to bite off, right? You know, being there, you know, just starting out with the city and what, you know, for our finance and accounting, accounting leaders in the audience, any tips and tricks that you've learned with this implementation, right? Because you're managing a big budget. Uh, you've got 1,400 employees to get onto payroll. Uh, anything you've learned in this process that could help someone else going through a future ERP implementation? I think the one thing that is to be careful with what you plan to implement right away. You know, I think when you look at that um, sales presentation, and then also we're coming from an antiquated system, everything looks great. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, yes, let's use Project Ledger, and let's use this feature and that feature. And, and then when it comes down to it, biting all of that apple all at once can be a bit overwhelming when you're already dealing with just the basic change management throughout the organization. And, and um, you know, we're redoing our whole chart of accounts. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. lot of things that are going along with it. And so then to also put in all the bells and whistles at the same time uh, is a little bit overwhelming. So we have been in the last four months or so some, taking off some of the extra whistles <laughs> and saying, well, you know, we, we don't have to do it all at once. You know, we no. need to get the basics done. We need to be able to operate. 
it's going to be much better and more efficient and better reports than we have now. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. Right. With an ERP system, so much to implement. And I, you know, in the software, all I say, like our development team has their product roadmap of what they're trying to implement and code and, and put into the product. And just like finance right now, we have our product roadmap with the tech stack and it, it evolves over time. Right. It's hard to slam everything in at one time and get it all working uh, at that time. You kind of have to phase it in, especially with such a big project that you're going through right now. Yeah, exactly. And some of it is not even necessarily um, finance based that we originally had envisioned we might do is currently we're not really inventorying a lot of things within the city. And so the idea was, oh, well, we're going to have the software that'll allow us to inventory things. So let's inventory everything, you know, and that means going out to all the different city departments and fleet management and, and inventorying what they have so that we can utilize the software and barcodes and, and have better um, control over our assets and know when purchasing needs to occur. But to implement an inventory process <laughs> when you're implementing a brand new system, it's not the right time. It's, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, so make sure you can bite off what you can chew when you and phase it right. It sounds like as far as like what people can learn, you know, from what you've just gone through. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you know, it's interesting looking at your background. You know, private sector experience, a lot of different industries that you've worked in. So as your career has progressed, was it a conscious choice to go into the public sector or did it just happen? Tell us how that private to, to public shift uh, occurred in, in your career. Sure, sure. Yeah, it, it really just happened. I had no intention, no desire to work in the public sector and and might be because I had a misconception, which maybe a lot of us do. I don't know that I'm alone with it, is that folks in the public sector are, you know, not as smart or as, um, <laughs> you know, um, uh, interested in working in fast-paced environments, mm -hmm. et cetera. You know, there's that cartoon with the DMV sloths. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I was working at an organization, NYK, which is a large ocean carrier, uh, international ocean carrier. And I was working, our, my main office was at the port of Los Angeles on Terminal Island. And so dealing with a lot of shipping containers and, and rail cars and those types of things in the operations. And that organization relocated all of their executive positions to New Jersey, and I opted not to make the move. And right around that same time, the Port of Long Beach, which is a division of the city of Long Beach, and they oversee all of the ports there, needed a finance director. And so I applied, and, and I was able to um, be offered the position. And the only reason I think I was qualified because it's public sector, you know, the different government accounting, GASB. I didn't know a yeah. GASB from a, you know, <laughs> yeah. from any other acronym. Yeah. And um, was because I had that freight experience and shipping experience. And I knew the operational side of it. I mean, I knew what a lease looked like for a terminal, et cetera. And so that was my first introduction to government accounting. And before I accepted the position, I did do some research and talk to people that had worked there in the past or that I knew that did work there, you know, and, and um, really learned that my, all my misconceptions about public sector employees were completely incorrect. You know, it was really a whole bunch of smart people working together, trying to make the best decisions for the community and, um, you know, wanting to be efficient and, mm -hmm. and having sometimes made career sacrifices in order to be in the public sector versus the private sector where you, um, you know, are eligible for bonuses and raises are more ad hoc. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there are certain benefits for sure. You have, uh, I, ha I used to have an Amex card that I could, you know, go out and buy lunch for people. And now if I want to bring donuts or bagels to the team, it comes out of my own pocket. Mm -hmm. That would be a gift of public funds if I brought snacks in for my team today. Yeah. Yeah. So a little different there. So, yeah, I mean, really interesting with that and, and kind of how your career progressed. And, you know, we talked today about the CFO being very operational and I, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, especially in the public sector, right? A city, like so much stuff going on, employees, labor, assets, fleets, you know, just all these moving pieces. So I, I think I know the answer, but I want to ask you like, you know, to be a successful CFO, in say a city, you know, is it, is it right more than just, it's more than just the debits and credits, but is there a very operational aspect to it? 
Um, yeah, there is. I've found that everywhere I've worked, it's the, and might be the reason I have been able to be successful in different industries is that I right away want to learn about the operations. I want to understand, you know, what is, what are these numbers I'm dealing with and, and why am I tracking them? And where am I, where are they coming from and who's looking at them next? And to be able to talk to the fire chief about, you know, his uh, new emergency services team that he wants to stand up and to know what questions to ask about how, what to include in that budget or um, where he might be able to secure funding, et cetera. You do need to have a somewhat knowledge of the operations um, just to be able to be a good partner to them and a resource for them in, in making sure that they're meeting their goals. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And, and for those who are looking to get into, say, public sector, finance and accounting, who are just starting out, maybe they're you know graduating from college, uh, is it similar to the private sector, you know, looking at, say, education, the degree, any certain characteristics or technical aspects or technical things that make someone, you know, say successful or are good, you know, like kind of good training background to, to go into public sector finance? I don't think it's any different than the private sector as far as mm -hmm. training. I mean, it's really, especially in the finance side of it, you know, good uh, being flexible and, and willing to, to crunch when you need to, to get those <laughs> reports out at deadline yeah. and uh, detailed orientated. I think um, the one thing that's different in the public sector is the hiring process. So the hiring process is quite different. And, and I think people that have just been in the private sector um, it get, can get confused or frustrated by it. And tell, shed a little light on that. Is it just much more like justification, stricter like process that you have to follow to get uh, a new uh, headcount approved? Yeah, yeah. There is a, a more of a justification and a process to get someone approved. And then the actual process of someone coming in, you know, there when a job is posted, there's a clear deadline of when it closes. Like this job is open and it's going to close on February 2nd. And that's when we're going to review all the resumes. And then we're going to do interviews and then we're going to make a selection where a job posting in the private sector, you know, you have no idea. Did they hire someone last week and it's still just sitting out here or have they not even looked at the resumes? Are they too busy to, to do? You know, you don't know where it is in the process. So there is some more transparency, but then also um, there's usually an interview panel and you're on a list and you're ranked. And so there's also a little bit more, uh, um, confusion that can be gone, go with it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like a little bit more of like a calendar date timelines. You've got to follow, you know, a little more involved in sense of more people involved. So interesting. Yeah, yeah. Which so, I find, I find comforting actually, because then, you know, with the private sector, you send out your resume or, or something mm -hmm. and you it goes into a abyss and you have no idea where you right. are in the process, where with the public sector, it's like, you know, it's like, oh, I know when they're going to look at it. And if I didn't hear from them, then that means I'm not interested versus mm -hmm. not even knowing whether or not you even got in there to get looked at. Yeah, no, interesting. Interesting. So a few final questions here. You're really curious, again, kind of public sector versus private sector and how things differ. You know, say uh, the budgeting process, <clears throat> excuse me, is that very similar to the private sector, and then right once you complete the budget, are then are you then forecasting the the, the fiscal year? The budget process is very similar. I mean, you start mm -hmm. um, six or nine months before the before the year starts, your fiscal year starts, and um, starting out with uh, all of your um, strategies and and you hit from whether it's the I worked for school districts, so we had a school board there, so I could still say the word board. <laughs> Um, you know, what is the board or city council? What are their priorities or the city manager? And then working down and providing templates to department heads so that they can build their, you know, individual line item budgets. Of course, estimating revenue comes first and mm -hmm. reviewing iterations to see if when you add all the pieces together, it adds up to the right whole. So that process is very similar. Um, the forecasting process is probably not as um, continuous as in the private mm -hmm. sector. I mean, I found in the private sector, sometimes you're doing monthly forecasts even, you know, because you constantly needed to know where do we think we're going to be? Do, do we need to make changes? So it's a little slower paced once the budget is built, because, again, a lot of your funding sources, it's locked in. You know, that's once you know or have estimated your tax collections or you know what grants you're going to receive, it's locked in. And then you're, you may be making adjustments to expenditures because your priorities have changed or you're not able to complete something. Um, that you thought you might be able to complete. Mm -hmm. that, that process is 
um, quite a bit different actually yep. once the budget's set. Okay, so it sounds like really intensive budget process, like your budget season kind of lasts, you know, for several months, you know, maybe private sector, it's just a couple months, but a lot of, a lot of planning coming up to that budget presentation, I assume, then that presentation to the city council and mayor then? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and you okay. usually have public workshops too, because again, it's, it's the public's money, so you want to get their input on, on where your priorities are and whether or not they think it's more important to fill in all the potholes or fix the restrooms at the park, you know, because maybe you don't have money to do everything. Yeah, 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 sounds good. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, really interesting. So, uh, yeah, forecasting maybe not as intense, but budget season sounds like, wow, that's that's probably a ton of work, you know, which it you know, usually it is. But, you know, so many, like I said, so many moving piece, pieces within the city and probably competing priorities, right? Uh, do you get a little bit of that, like resource allocation, so many different cities, departments, or I'm sorry, so many different departments within the city that, you know, do you have kind of competing like demands on, on resources? Yeah, definitely. I think with any organization you do, um, we're in a good position. And I think fortunate for when I joined, I'd mentioned we had that tax measure pass in November 2020 and the tax was, began being collected April 1st, 2021. And I joined in June of 2021. So I came on after the really lean years. <laughs> and, and not that we're, you know, swimming in resources or anything, but it, it has relieved some of that um, really stretched resources and a lot of competing demands. So we're in a much better mm -hmm. position now as a city. Okay, that's great. Yeah, so it sounds like things are rolling forward nicely. Sales tax increase plus an ERP system going through you. So hopefully make your process more efficient each month. So one final question to wrap up here. And if you had one piece of advice to give to modern finance leaders, what would it be? You know, looking back through your finance and accounting career, any any advice that you give to those you know, coming up the ranks right now? I think it's something I already mentioned before, which is just get familiar with operations. Like to mm -hmm. me, it makes the job so much more interesting and you're able to be a more valuable partner to the folks in operations, whether that's the you know CEO or a manager out in the warehouse. If you understand where, where they're coming from or try to learn what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, I consider finance as a sort of a service providing a service to the rest of the organization and to really be able to be a better, um, you know, provide better service. I think understanding the operations, and like I said, it's much more interesting as well for you mm -hmm. than just plugging numbers in and around places. Yes. Yeah. So operations, right. sounds like key to becoming an effective CFO and leaders. So really appreciate your time, Betsy. It sounds like your hands are full. A lot of good things going on there. Very complex operation that a lot of people don't realize that's happening underneath the scenes at a city. So really appreciate your time today and shedding light on the private versus public sector differences. So thanks a lot. Yeah, no, thank you for having me here. It was fun. All right. Thank you. Thank you.